That so many of us battle our thoughts, right, our thought life, and some of us have thoughts we would rather people not know. Matter of fact, most of the thoughts you have in your life, you never speak of because we feel shame, we feel guilt about it. Some of us have some really deep, like, self-defeating thoughts that hurt us as people, kind of leave us down, and our thoughts uh, really wreak havoc in our lives. And what we're going to discover today is that we are all in a thought war. There's a thought battle, and the enemy seeks to destroy you. And his battleground in your life is your thoughts. But the Bible is chock full of wisdom. How many of you know that, right? That the Bible has some truth that you and I can lean into to experience the freedom of the thought war that rages in our minds. And this whole message series is really designed to help you and I to develop a radical faith, a, a, a faith that is a walk on water kind of faith. And if you're tired of having a faith that feels weak or sedentary faith and a faith that just seems to lack zest in your life, this message is for you because too many of us, we think that our thoughts are benign, but the reality is your thoughts are either going to bring life or your thoughts are going to bring death. Our, our lives are always going in the direction of our strongest, most compelling thoughts. Think about your greatest self-criticisms to yourself. Do your criticisms help you to move forward or do they keep you back? What might they sound like? You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You'll never make it ahead. You, you know, life is always throwing curveballs at you. All of this self-defeating talk that actually renders us uh, pretty incapable very often of being everything that God has called us to be. Scripture reminds us that every one of you in Christ Jesus is called by God for God's purpose. Ephesians 2.10 says that we were created in Christ Jesus, in God, before the foundations of the earth, God had a plan and a purpose for our lives, amen? And, and what gets in the way so often is, that, 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 is those thoughts that, that really keep us stuck. And we know that eternity has more for us because our hearts are always wanting something better. We always want something more. What is it that we're really trying to get back to? We're trying to get back to that place where there is no separation between God and man. Thank God that's made possible through Jesus. We're trying to get back to that place where we weren't like subject to self-put-downs and criticisms. And what you got to realize is you learn to be critical of yourself from someone else in your life. Every critical thought you have is something somebody once spoke to you or something you concluded in your life from a life experience. And it's holding you back. But I believe by faith that if you really open your heart to God and say, Jesus, here's my brokenness, God. I I give it to you. Jesus, he, here's, here's where my thoughts are at. And, and they're not healthy. These thoughts don't glorify you. Well, God, I give them to you right now. And, and I believe if you do that, I believe God's going to work something really powerful in your life throughout this message this morning that you'll be able to bring further with you. And, and guys, we're, we're not alone in this thought battle where our thoughts either will encourage us or discourage us, bring life or death. The psalmist <coughs> in Psalm 43, 5 said this, Why my soul... Are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Let's just stop there. This is a normal part of the Christian life. This reality that as Christians, a very important part of discipleship is that we self-reflect. The psalmist was able to look at his life and say, hey, this is really incongruent. The way I feel, feeling downcast and disturbed, why am I feeling that way? So many of us just go through life never asking the important questions. And we just kind of accept things the way they are. But the psalmist is like, no, I have a God in heaven. Man, I, and God is real and God is for me. And I'm not going to allow myself to stay stuck where I'm at. And your victory starts with a decision of surrender to God that says, man, I'm not going to stay stuck where I'm at. Then the psalmist goes on after insight and awareness and ownership. And he says, put your hope in God for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Why are you so downcast? Why do you look that way? Man, put your hope in God and experience the truth of God, the love of God. So many of us don't go that distance. We stop at, well, I just feel crummy, and that's true of me. And then we wonder why, man, we're stuck in this battle. We're never getting ahead. But, but here's the truth. And, and you got to ask yourself this deep question that will reveal truth to you. Are you happy with the way you feel in your life right now? Are you happy with the circumstances of your life right now? And I got to tell you, if you're not, it has less to do with what's happening around you and much more to do with what's happening from within you. And, and that's something we deeply have to own because your perspective about life, your perspective about your hardships and your struggle, all of which are real, your perspective 
is what is going to lead your choices, your behaviors, your life habits. Your perspective is the conclusions you make about what's happening in your life. So if you're experiencing loss, difficulty, someone passed away, you might say, God, you've abandoned me. And then we go through life never actually healing, believing God is distant, and God turned his back on us. Conversely, God, I've experienced deep loss. Would you be with me in my pain? God, I'm going to run to your name. God, I'm going to feel your comfort. Then we go on from that place of pain through a process of healing, knowing God is with us and for us. You see, here's the problem with a lie. If you believe a lie, you will still live your life like it's true. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in your life. Scripture says that the tongue will bring life or death. And we have two tongues, the one everyone hears and the one that only you hear in your mind. And what you have to recognize is your thoughts will either bring you hope in life or your thoughts are going to bring you desolation. Well, what's desolation? Desolation is the experience of emptiness, complete emptiness and destruction. And that's what unhealthy demonic thoughts lead to. So many of us think our thoughts are benign. We're naive to think that there isn't some devil that is behind every weakness, behind every struggle, that is not tempting you to think horribly about yourself, and yet the Bible says we are children of God. And we ask God for forgiveness, but yet many of us go through life never really forgiving ourselves. And we hold on to it as if God's holding on to it. And yet his word is true that he's faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. But who is the condemner? It's the enemy. And here's the scary part. When you speak life, you speak God's native tongue, which is life and truth. When you speak death over yourself or your destruction, you speak the devil's native tongue. And as, as Christ followers, we have to recognize this is an important part of discipleship that we so easily forget, that we have to learn how to manage our thoughts in a biblically right way. I've struggled with anxiety my whole life. I, would, I come from a long line of, of anxious people. And then all of a sudden, there was me, and I had anxiety. And for much of my life, my life was driven by anxious thoughts and worries and doubts. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You go home and you replay conversations from your day. Somebody doesn't respond to you. You're on your phone going, let me reread this to see if Siri messed up and I offended them. And that's why they're not responding to me. Man, I put something up on social media. Man, why is nobody looking at it, right? Some of us are driven that way. But I got to tell you, 15 years ago, I made a decision in my walk with the Lord. It was about five years after I got saved. I said, you know what? I'm not living this way anymore. This doesn't glorify God. And I have some responsibility and how I manage my thought life, because I'm a steward of my thoughts. So I made a, really, a, a, a desperate prayer, a desperate plea. God, would you help me? Here's my thoughts. And I started to hold my thoughts accountable. And today, yes, I still struggle with anxiety, but not the thought, the thought part of it. Why? Because you know what? When a thought pops in into my mind, I, I, I step away from it in Jesus' name, and I run to his word, and I correct that anxious worry and doubt with the word of God, and I experience freedom. But it's a choice that one has to make every day. And, and there's four types of thoughts that you're going to really experience in your life. The first one is your thoughts are patterns and habits that have been developed over a long period of time in your life, whether good or bad. Every thought process you have is a habit. So when something gets hard and you tell yourself, you know what, it's hard, but God's going to give me strength. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Uh, if they can do it, I can do it. That's a habit. If you reinforce that, that's going to bring life. Conversely, the opposite's true. Things get hard. I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to get through this. You will never experience recovery in your life. So for right or wrong, recognize that you and I are responsible for the thoughts we entertain and the thoughts we reinforce in our lives. This is where discipleship comes in. If I'm the temple of God, if I have died to myself and I've become a new creation in Christ, that means I am no longer my own. I'm bought and paid for with a price. That means I have to be able to manage my thoughts, this temple, because the thoughts I allow are either going to walk me into God's purpose or it's going to keep me out of it. Your thoughts and habits matter. The second is, some of your thoughts are attacks of the evil one. Do you ever wonder that, you know, when you're not feeling well, when you're sick, your thought or something's going wrong in your life, your thoughts go more negative? We see this moment uh, in, with Jesus when he was in the desert for 40 days fasting. Who was the other voice that showed up in the desert at some point when Jesus was hungry and thirsty? It was the evil one. And how did Jesus himself 
the Son of God, God himself, second member of the Trinity, how did he defend himself, protect himself, push away the enemy? Scripture says if you resist the devil, he must what? He's got to flee. And Jesus used Scripture to combat the lie and the temptation of the evil one. So some of your thoughts are actually inspired by the evil one himself. Re remember what God told Cain right before Cain sinned. There was temptation. And he says, Cain, be on guard. Sin is crouching at your door. Sin's knocking. It desires to have you. How could a temptation have a desire unless there was a spirit behind it? We're in a battle. We're in a spiritual war. And how you fight really matters. The next line of thinking we have is intrusive thoughts. And this one's going to set some people free. Because every human being, except for Joe, struggles with intrusive thoughts, right? What's an intrusive thought? An intrusive thought is a thought that feels like it comes from the outside, and it's intrusive on our, on our minds. <clears throat> it's often an undesirable thought or an undesirable image. And then so many of us feel like, I can't believe I had that thought. I remember many years ago, I was sitting down with a mom who was just riddled with guilt and shame riddled. She just had a baby. Her baby was about four or five months old. And she says, pastor, I got to talk to you, man. I'm really struggling. And she says, I, I have these crazy thoughts of hurting my baby, but I would never do that. And she started to cry. And I realized what was happening. She had no desire to hurt her baby. It was an intrusive thought that popped into her mind. But, but here's the deal with intrusive thoughts. You don't have to be in agreement with them. You have a choice when they come. You're either going to own it and say, that's my thought. And that's indicative of something about me, or it's an intrusive thought. Everybody has crazy thoughts. How many of you have, have crazy thoughts? Go raise your hand. Every one of you, if your hands are not up, you lied in church this morning. I'm going to pray for you. Right? That's a, we'll do that message next week. Like, crazy thoughts happen in your mind. There's thoughts you have, you're like, I, I pray nobody knows. <laughs> right? And, and here's the thing with intrusive thoughts, right? You have the ability to say, they're not mine. I'm not in agreement with that. I'm in agreement with what the Lord speaks, with what Scripture says. I'm going to align myself with that truth. You see what I do when intrusive thoughts come? I'm a very principles and values-driven person. If a crazy thought pops into my mind, which they do, time and time again, especially when I'm stressed or anxious, right? I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I'm not in alignment with that. And then I find biblical truth I am in alignment with. And I'm like, that describes my heart and my mind. And then when you don't deal with intrusive thoughts in a healthy way and you start to allow them to define you and you draw bad conclusions about yourself, I'm a horrible person. I thought of that. Then they become obsessive thoughts. And obsessive thoughts are thoughts that replay over and over and over again in your mind. And very often, these thoughts also are unwanted. They could be related to mental health. They could be related to tra deep trauma in your life, uh, moments of acute stress, right? And, and if that's where they're coming from, you need help with that. But obsessive thoughts can also be interest-driven thoughts, things we think about all of the time. And you don't have to wear that. Simply by saying, you know what? I'm not in agreement with these thoughts. I'm going to redirect my actions. The devil hurts so many hearts and minds because of the conclusions we draw about the thoughts we have. All of our thoughts don't define who you are. Your values and your principles do, and how you choose to live your life is a better definition than the craziness that pops into our mind. Some of us can't get some songs from 20 years ago out of our head, right? It's just the way our brain works. And when we're under stress, that's what happens. But guys, you're not alone. There's a guy in scripture uh, who's a prophet. His name was Elijah. He had, he had this amazing experience where he was walking by faith, and he defeated 450 prophets of Baal. And, the, and it was like drought for like three and a half years. And by God's grace, by faith, he was able to pray, and the sky was open, and, 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 and the water came. And th this guy did something unheard of in their day. He stood against a king and a whole kingdom named King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And he walked in victory. But after the victory, how many of you know sometimes you get tired? You got a little tired. So King Ahab went and told his wife everything. We're going to pick up with 1 Kings 19, uh, verse 1 to 5. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Meaning she's threatening his life to kill him. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Let's just stop there. How in the world was this guy afraid? He just literally killed 
450 prophets. He saw the hand of God move. God is moving in him and through him doing miraculous things. Something shifted in Elijah's heart and in his mind in that moment. Verse 3, he was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Bethsaida in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom brush, bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors, right? What is he talking about there? His ancestors lacked faith. In that moment, he felt like his faith completely crumbled. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel of the Lord uh, touched him and said, get up and eat. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Verse uh, 3 and 4, we're going to go back there again. Elijah, again, ran for his life, right? So let's just stop there. Here you got this guy who literally experienced the highest of highs, And now in his life, the complete lowest of lows. You got to be really careful in the transitions of your life. When do crazy thoughts come? And and if you want radical faith, you have to learn not to be thought driven. You got to be values driven, biblical truth driven. You, You see, he got into his own head because he was vulnerable. Sometimes you get a little hangry, right? You're, uh, you're hungry, and then that leads to your anger, and you're vulnerable, and you know what? Sometimes the beast comes out, right? Sometimes you're sick. You're tired, you're stressed, there's marital problems. And who's prowling around on the skirts of your life is the enemy. Scripture says that he prowls around like a lion looking for somebody to devour. His ministry is to kill, steal, and destroy. Elisha found himself at a bad place, and some of you find yourself there today. Some of you know what I'm talking about because you've dealt with horrible thoughts for most of your life. And God wants you to have a victory. Your intrusive thoughts don't define you, neither do your obsessive thoughts. But sometimes your obsessive thoughts become desirable thoughts. Well, what do I mean by that? Some of us feel guilt and shame because you deal with unwanted thoughts, hurting people, saying things you shouldn't say, sexual thoughts about somebody who's not your husband or your wife. And then you have a choice. Do I entertain these things or do I walk away from them? Elijah entertained them. He was tired. He was exhausted. And in that, he concluded, I'm no better than my ancestors. I would just rather die. So instead of trusting God, he ran ahead of God is what he did. And you got to realize in those moments, our, our thoughts really go into three realms. One, we become a victim, and we feel like everyone's against us, and then we want to blame everyone and everything for the challenges in our life rather than dealing with them head on. We develop a woe is me mentality, which is, man, I'm never going to get ahead. There's never going to be better days. Man, it's always going to be like this. Or we develop a self-destructive mentality, which is the self-put downs and the hurts. And you're speaking the enemy's native tongue at yourself. So rather than sitting in these moments, and these happen to everybody. You, you, you know you're not alone. Happened to Elijah, happens to me, happens to you. So, so these should be red flags. Rather than sitting at this place, you have a choice. That I'm going to walk with God or I'm going to walk down this negative, this negative path. These red flags need to alert you not to self-care. And why do I say self-care? Because self-care is not enough. It's inadequate. It's very one-dimensional. When we think self-care, you think of a day off. You think of a vacation. You think of, I got to go to the gym. But really, it's soul care. The, the, if you want to walk with God and you want to disciple and start to manage your thoughts better, we have to start thinking soul care. What's soul care? It looks at the person holistically as a person who we need to pay attention to our physical. Am I eating right, right? Elisha wasn't eating. And we're going to look at what God did for him in just a moment. The guy was so stressed out, he just lost zest of life. So, so is my physical healthy? Am I going to the doctor? Am I taking care of myself? Why? I'm a steward of a temple that belongs to him. My biologic. How's my sleep patterns going? Like, am I, is my body doing what it needs to do? Emotional. Like some of us pull away when we get stressed and isolate. The devil's favorite kind of Christian is an isolated Christian. And if you don't know what you believe about God today and you're spiritually seeking, like this is a, whether you're walking with God or not, this is the same pattern for people. Well, I don't want no one to think that about me. I don't want to be exposed. Man, I don't want to say anything. What are we really trying to push away? Shame and exposure. What does the devil want for you to stay in hiding? What does scripture say? To confess our sins to one another so that we would be healed. God forgives. Somehow healing happens 
when we share with one another. Well, what if I'm sick? What if I'm down? Scripture says go to the elders of the church so they can anoint you with oil and pray over you. And the prayer of the righteous has power. But when we isolate, we're not fighting God's way. We're actually not fighting at all. And you leave yourself pray for the evil one. Relationally, right? I got to think of myself holistically, right? We have physical, biological, emotional, relational. We have two more. Like, am I digging into relationship and the right types of relationships? My physiological, my, I mean, sorry, my psychological. How's my thought life? How's my mental health going? And then also your vocational needs in your life. Like looking at yourself holistically, that's what true soul care is. And so many of us stop short at that. And we wonder why we're dealing with the thought patterns in our life because you're too busy to care for you. You're too busy very often to pray. And when we're, not, when we're not in a habit of praying regularly and running to God when things don't hurt, when they hurt, we don't have the muscle memory to run to God, right? We all sit there and we know that if we go to the gym and we work out, right? It hurts. I hate the gym. How many of you love the gym? How many of you hate the gym like me? Probably most of you. But we go if we want to be healthy. But eventually the pain stops. Lactic acid doesn't build up anymore. Man, I'm getting tired up here. And what ends up happening, right? We build muscle memory. And our body starts to recognize, that. oh, I need to do this all the time and every day. Your spirituality is the same way. God isn't the one we ought to run to only when there's trouble. We should run to God every day when there is no trouble so that when it comes, I already have the muscle memory to do it. So many of us, when stress comes, we forget to pray. You ever been there? And then somebody's like, did you pray? And you're like, oh, that's right. sorry, God, that's right. And we pray. It's a muscle memory issue. That alerts me when I have that feeling. I haven't been praying enough recently because the muscle memory wasn't there. And, and you've got to realize when you're hurting your thoughts, you, you're going to run to self-deprecation, right? Or you're going to run to something unhealthy to cope with that difficult reality. Who and what do you run to when you're exhausted? Elijah ran away. Unlike the psalmist, he didn't start with self-insight and awareness. He just ran and he sulked in his misery. Who and what do you run to when things hurt? Jesus makes a wonderful promise. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all of you who are weary and tired, and I will give you rest. Where does our rest come from? It comes from him. James 4 says, draw near to God, and he's going to draw near to, to you. It's the promises of God. Proverbs 18, 10 says, the name of the Lord is a fortified tower. It's a strong fortress, and the righteous run to it to be safe. Where am I safe when I run to his name? And, the, and so many people think this is metaphoric. Oh, run to God, run to his name. It's a metaphor. It's not a metaphor. It's the normal life of every Christ follower. That when life gets hard, God, I run to your name because I know where my hope is. My hope is in you. When my thoughts get bad, I realign myself with your truth. I, I run to your name because you define me and who I am. You know why some people make really terrible decisions in life, date the wrong people, drugs, alcohol, hookup culture? Why? Because you think too little of yourself. But you know what? We treat well the things we value. Are you too good for drugs? I hope so. Are you too good to be used in a hookup culture and somebody just to sleep with you and leave you? I hope you're too valuable for that. But we put ourselves out there to be used and abused by life and we build up all this emotional baggage and then we point the finger at God, another thought, and we blame him. When in reality, he's like, you ran to him and her and this and that. When are you going to run to me? You'll never, you'll never thirst again. The woman at the well, he says, I'm going to give you living water and you will never thirst again. Our hope is in him. And you know what the, what's so amazing about God? Is he's the God of do-overs. He's the God of second chances. You know, we see the psalmist as we open, you know, with that scripture. And he's looking at his life and he's like, why are you so downcast? I'm going to realign myself with God. Then we see Elijah who's just, man, he goes so far ahead of God and he just wants to die. And God doesn't abandon him. What God does is he refreshes him. Let's look at 1 Kings 19. Uh, we're going to go back to 5 and we're going to read through 9. 
Then he lay down under a bush and fell asleep. All at once the angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then laid down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. Let's just stop there. No matter where you've been, what you've done, what you've thought, how you might have canceled yourself in your life and thought, man, you know what? I've gone too far for God. God, man, my sins are too bad. He'll never forgive me. Or maybe he's forgiven me, but you know what? God can't use me to do anything because, man, I'm just so downtrodden and I beat myself up so much. You know what scripture says? That your calling is irrevocable. That means no matter where you've been, when you, give a, when you do a, a, an about face and you turn around, God's like, let's pick up where you, where you left off. He doesn't cancel you because he loves you. And, and, you're, and God's love is so much greater than your biggest sin. God's grace for you, his commitment to you, his desire that you would walk with him is so much greater than any thought or thing you have ever done in your life. And that's the mighty God we serve. And, and, and the angel said, you got to eat. Because the journey is going to be too tough for you. So many of us, there's such a deep truth here. Because when life gets hard, what do we want? God, pluck me out of my problems. God, take it away from me. God, I don't want to deal with it. And we expect God to move like this. And very often, sometimes he does that, but very often God is more concerned about growing you in the context of your challenges than he is about removing the challenge from you. We don't want to grow. That's the reality. We say we do. I want to grow. God, give me patience. Anybody ever tell you don't pray for that? Because it hurts. All growth hurts. When you go to the gym and you got big biceps like Jesus, that dude went through a lot of pain. And if you, and if you don't go through that kind of pain, you're never going to grow. you got to stretch the muscle fibers. You also have to stretch your spiritual muscle as well. And it comes through pain. And here's the thing. God doesn't abandon you in the journey. He gives you what you need to get through the journey. That's his faithfulness. Not, hey, walk it alone, but I'm going to walk with you through this. And my promise to you is I will sustain you through this, and the outcome will be your growth. And then by the end of this journey, you're going to love me more. You're going to experience me greater. Your faith is going to be grown. And so many of us allow our thoughts to hijack us. And today, I think for many of you, it can be the day of breakthrough. If you're like, God, I'm tired of these thoughts. I'm no longer going to allow them to define me. Let's go back to verse 8. So he got up, he ate, and he drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave, spent the night. The Lord appears to Elijah again, right? And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? Oh, I've got a question for you. For the thoughts that you've entertained, the thoughts that you've allowed in your life to define you, what in the world are you doing here? Some of you are at a place you need to leave in your minds. There's conclusions you've drawn that God wants you to abandon. And how does the story end? God gave him the strength and he went back into the will of God where he needed to be. Your thoughts will take you places you don't need to be. We're the worst salesmen to ourselves. You guys realize that. How many of you love car salesmen? Nobody. But if you're a car salesman here or online, we do love you and we pray for you. We pray for your soul. Like, we talk ourselves in and out of things. We talk ourselves out of the will of God. We talk ourselves into bad situations, bad relationships. Then we justify it. In the end, we don't like how it came out. And we're like, well, how'd that go wrong, God? And I think what we have to recognize is an important part of discipleship is I have to start to begin to take responsibility over the choices that I make, understanding the choices I make are inspired by the thoughts I have. Here's a quick tip. If it doesn't line up with the will of God, don't do it. You don't need to pray. Listen to this. You don't need to pray about what his word already made clear. Well, maybe God wants me in this relationship. Well, maybe his word said you're unequally yoked. Well, it's not that bad to... To drink to the point in alcohol we know is not a sin. The Bible does not say it's a sin, but getting drunk is. Well, it's okay if I get a little tipsy. Well, the Word of God says if you're drunk, you're in sin. 
Like, we make all these excuses. Well, you know what? I got the money. I can spend it. It's my money. Santa J.G. Wentworth commercial. It's not my money, and I want it now. Like, you, you guys got to realize, like, we're stewards of what God entrusted. It's his money. So rather than me saying, I'm going to go spend it because I earned it and it's mine, man, I'm not going to be so arrogant. God, might you have bigger and better plans for the money than I do? So many of us are willing to, thoughts, are willing to settle for pleasure now at the expense of greatness later. It's all about thoughts. It's all about what's happening in your inner life. And, and we have to deal with this. So many of us have the temptation not to deal with it. Oh, it's just thoughts. It's no big deal. I've lived with it so long. And you end up elongating the storm you live with in your life. Here's a, here's a quick story. I'm going to tell you guys about buffalo and cattle. Actually, buffalo and all other animals. When a storm comes, where do you guys run? We run away from the storms. That's what we do as people. When animals experience a storm, what they do is they run ahead of the storm because they see it coming and they don't want to be in it. The buffalo is actually the only animal who sees a storm, and before it even hits, they run toward it. And then when they're in the storm, they just keep running through it. What ends up happening to the animals that run away from the storm? They actually elongate their exhaustion. They elongate their time in the storm. Because as they're moving this way, and the storm above them is moving this way, they're elongating their time in it. The buffalo deals with his hardship head on, and he runs through it actually shortening the amount of stress and time he spends in the storm. Now, he runs to the center of that bad boy, and it's hard, and it's heavy, but he runs right through it, and he keeps running until he comes out the other side. And why is that important for you and I as an illustration? Because God wants you to fight, to fight like it matters, to no longer be a victim of your thoughts because your thoughts will rob you of your radical faith. Because you know what Scripture says? Walk by faith, not by sight. But when my sight voice is too loud... I don't hear my faith voice. And I end up walking by sight instead of faith because I'm afraid, because I'm anxious, because I don't know how it's going to turn out. When God says you don't need to know the future, you just need to know who holds it in their hands. Amen. And you need to walk by faith, which means, you know what? My, my flesh voice needs to shut his trap. I need to stop listening to myself so much, and I need to start preaching to myself a little more. And I need to start speaking life into my situation. We're going to go back to the psalmist. Psalm 119, 11, 111 to 116 says this. Your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. Here's my values. This is what I want my thoughts to be. This is what I'm aligning myself with is your word. And he knew where his hope came from. Then he says this, verse 112. We're actually going to stop at 112. I incline my heart to perform your statues forever to the end. Let's just stop. Say the word incline. You, you have a recliner at the house? The old school ones, you pull the lever, you lay back. The new ones, you press the button and it goes back slowly. And, and you know what? It's aided by gravity. And how many of you lack core strength like me? Getting up is a doozy sometimes. And my legs got to dangle and then eventually I get up. Joe Marie sometimes rescues me, pulls my arm. And, and the reality is so many of us live in a declined state spiritually. And the psalmist is like, you need to get up. You need to incline your spirit. He's speaking to himself. Too many of us spiritually live in a declined state. Guys, it's time to get up and fight. It's time to get up and say, God, no longer am I going to allow the enemy to have victory over my thought life. I'm now choosing to align with your word. And guys, guess what? It's hard. Changing your thoughts is not easy. It's a battle. It's going to the spiritual gym. It's putting in the reps. It's putting in the sets. And I'm in it to win it. And as you give God something to bless... What does God do? He grows it. That's what he does. I, I want to just recap for you six things we covered that are your take-homes. Six things you guys can start doing that are biblically based to start bringing like some spiritual legs under you to manage your thoughts better. This should be in your app, but if um, you don't have your app open, you can write it in your notes. Number one, you have to, like the psalmist, identify and challenge negative thoughts. Self-insight and awareness is a normal part of healthy Christian discipleship. You can't confess a sin you're not aware of. You can't get a healing of something. You don't say, God, here is my heart and my brokenness. Would you take it? I, you can't surrender what you don't know you need to surrender. The, the Christian who doesn't self-reflect often leads to pride. And what that looks like is the person that is incapable of saying, I'm sorry. Some of us are married to the person that never apologizes. Some of you or the person that never apologizes. And where does that come from? A lack of self-insight, awareness, and fear that you could be wrong. Number two, 
pay attention to thoughts that cause stress and anxiety. So many of us, we just kind of go through life so quick and we just, we spend life scrolling. You know what happens when we're scrolling? We're not thinking, we're not feeling, we're not present in the moment in our own lives. You want healthy spirituality? Healthy spirituality is contemplative spirituality. It means I'm going to make time for me and God. I'm going to make time to hear God's voice, and I'm going to make time to be aware of the voice of my heart and what it's telling me. Do you know that your feelings are like prophets to your soul? And they indicate to you when something's healthy or unhealthy. And if my feelings are off, if I'm feeling salty, if I'm feeling bitter, if I'm having trouble forgiving someone, I need to really look into that. Because if I don't, those thoughts are going to run wild with themselves and lead, lead to death. So what do I do? I have to restructure my thoughts. CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, calls this cognitive restructuring. Guess what? They think they discovered all this, but it was all in the Bible first. You all know that, right? <laughs> Scripture says cognitive restructuring. I take every thought captive. means I arrest the thoughts that don't bring God glory, and I make them obedient to God. Cognitive restructuring says I'm going to replace unhealthy thoughts with healthy thoughts. Biblical truth says... Every demonic thought I have, I'm going to take it captive. I'm going to arrest that bad boy. I'm going to force it to be obedient. And how do I do that? I'm no longer in agreement with you. This isn't my thought. I claim biblical truth over my life, the better truth alternative. And that's that's how we restructure our thoughts. Number three, thought-stopping techniques. When I have an intrusive thought, you know what I do? I just quickly push it away. I stop it. I almost visualize a big stop sign. That's not my thought. And 15, 16 years ago, that's actually the verbiage I started using. That's not my thought. This is what I believe. It was that simple for me. And you have to be able to stop your thoughts. Some of you at the very beginning of this are like, yeah, that sounds easier said than done. Well, what might you have to do? You got to get up and you got you to change your environment. You, you might have to like go from the living room where those thoughts are happening into the kitchen. You might need to phone a friend and say, can you pray with me for me? I'm struggling with thoughts. Do something other than sit where you're at. Because you know what? If that thought's happening there and you can't manage it in your own strength, I know who can. It's God, but you got to run to him. You know what helps me too sometimes? I just put worship music on. When I'm dealing with negative thoughts and, man, they just keep like an onslaught and they're hitting me, I put on worship music and I realign with those biblical truths. It's just life to my soul. Number four, focus on positive truths, uh, not just positivity, because positivity in this world helps nobody. Biblical positive truth. And I claim it over my life. And if you want to move from a place of beating yourself up, you know, feeling like the black sheep of the family and all that, why don't you speak life over yourself and speak what God speaks over you? You're an heir to the throne of God. You're a brother or sister with Christ Jesus. You're grafted in. You're the apple of God's eye. You're a child of the living God. God celebrates you. Why not speak that over your life? Number five and six, we'll get there right now, is emotional awareness. What's happening in my soul? Man, I probably ask myself that question two, three times a week. I do, and, you know, as my daily devotion, that probably comes up on, a, on, on different levels at various times. But at least two, three times a week, I assess, like, what's happening in my soul? My wife knows this. Sometimes I'll just get in the car and I'll go for a ride. She's like, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going for a scenic ride. Why? Because I need time alone to assess what's happening inside. And if I can't figure it out, you know I'm calling a friend, a brother in Christ, to walk with me through that. And number six is keep perspective. Keep perspective. God is truth. Scripture says, and every man is a liar. Which means when you speak what is not lining up with the word, guys, it's a lie. And that's how you start to rein in your thoughts. That's how you start to have victory. And from that, you can develop a faith that is completely radical. I want to leave you guys with this last verse as we wind down. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, um, they have divine power to demolish strongholds, which means your battle that's hard is possible. Might be hard, but with God, all things are possible. We demolish arguments of every uh, pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought, and we make it obedient to Christ. It starts for you with a decision. God, I'm all in. God, I'm ready for the fight. I'm tired of sitting on the bench, watching the game of life happen, and I'm tired of losing. I want to win. And I want to win in my thought life so that that can manifest through my my life. Look, if you're not giving and you're not serving and you're not worshiping, and you got to ask yourself what's happening in you that's keeping you from what God's best is for your life. 
So many of us, we dream of opening businesses and it's like, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. But we never get past the planning stage. It's a limited thinking. God, I don't want to be a person who thinks with limitations. I want to be a person who thinks limitless. You see, you serve an eternal God who promises you some amazing things, but you got to walk with them. you got to invite them into that pain. And your journey toward healing in your thought life starts with an invitation inward. And for some of you, that might be a relationship with God. Maybe you've never said, shared, or honest about the reality that I just want God in my life and I believe Jesus is the son of God who died for my sins. Scripture says if you believe that God sent Jesus who, as a son of God, who paid your sin debt, rose from the dead. Scripture says you confess that with your mouth, you're saved. So that's where life begins. That's actually where eternity begins. It begins at that moment of conception, that relationship between you and God. Others have made that decision, but they've never addressed their thoughts. This is for you. And this is your moment to say, God, I invite you to bring healing, and I'm going to start fighting because I know who's fighting with me. Let me pray with you. Father God, we thank you, Jesus, for your truth and your word that sets us free. That's what scripture says. Lord God, that the word does not come back void. Lord God, we pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would set the captives free. If you're here this morning, I'm not gonna ask you to do anything weird, but, but if you're here and maybe you don't know God as the Lord and Savior of your life, but you wanna be saved, you want a relationship with God, just confess that between you and God right now. God, forgive me of my sins, I repent. I turn from them, God. I believe Jesus is the son of God who died for my sins and paid my sin debt. I believe you rose him from the dead and he is Lord. I believe that in my heart. I place my trust in you. If you prayed that prayer and you believe that, scripture says you're saved. For the rest of you, Lord God, would you change our hearts and our minds and Lord God, give us a fighter's spirit. Lord God, that we're not gonna shrink back. We're not gonna back down. We're gonna march forward because Lord God, you're building your kingdom and we want to be part of that work. We don't want to watch it from the bench. We don't want our thoughts to take us captive. We actually arrest them right now in Jesus' name and we force their obedience through your word. Lord God, I pray that you would, your Holy Spirit, Lord God, would be the only voice we hear in our minds and in our hearts. Bless your people, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.